Uh, you have your microservices there up in green. That could be your Spring, your Go, your Quarkus, or whatever it is you'd like. I think the important part, and so uh, Kafka is the pub sub, uh, soon to be Q. Um, often it, they usually call a Kafka a Q, uh, but technically right now it's a pub sub. There is an improvement process to also make it a Q as well. But I think, uh, what number is that? I can bring my glasses down. Number seven. <laughs> so the number seven, which is this link right over here, the Kafka over to these databases, I think is one of the more important technologies when it comes to Kafka, and that is once messages arrive in Kafka, put that into a database. Or once something enters into a particular database, you know, send that one over to Kafka. That's called Kafka Connect. Uh, one of the big entries in, you know, uh, how we discuss things and how we uh, discuss architecture is Apache Pinot as well. So data is going to get transformed, it's going to get manipulated into the form that you want. And in whatever form that you want, you may want to aggregate that later for like business intelligence and other things like that. And that's where Apache uh, Pinot comes in and you can aggregate the information as it comes into Kafka. Uh, Apache Spark is uh, still highly relevant uh, for uh, our big data type architecture. So uh, we have streaming with Spark, uh, we have uh, machine learning with Spark, so Spark ML uh, is available as well. And uh, the other part that you're going to be hearing a lot of uh, let me go back, uh, just one there. How'd that TensorFlow get there? There we go. <laughs> uh, so the other part is this. This is the streaming portion right over here. So let's say, for example, I want to submit a credit card application and I want to decide whether I want, or this company wants to provide a credit uh, to this applicant. So how does this look? Well, um, you know, we could make a, a REST call or we could have a web presence over here on that microservice. Uh, the moment that they hit submit, uh, bring that over into Kafka. Once it's there into Kafka, then this whole engine, it's like a living being of data, uh, will then take over. So what do I want to do with it? Well, uh, this message could come in. Immediately afterwards, I can have any of these stream processes then take over, like your Kafka streams, which is I'm going to take this particular message, and let's say I'm going to classify that with some kind of machine learning algorithm. And so that's where that's where, there we go, oh. <laughs> there it goes, disappeared, let's come back. That's where something like a TensorFlow can come in. So you could apply some machine learning to it. You don't have to do machine learning if you don't want to, but that's gonna be the idea for this. So uh, wonderful uh, architecture behind all this, and that's the whole idea of uh, what it is that we're trying to communicate. So we're just going to discuss what Kafka is, uh, so that way you can take that knowledge, and uh, when you take a look at, at uh, other people's presentations, uh, you'll see what they're talking about and what that means. So um, Kafka messaging. So uh, similar to a row of record, uh, message is an array of bytes, no special serialization. And so what do I mean by that? Um, whether it's a string, whether it's an integer, whether it's a JSON, whether it's an Avro, whether it's whatever it is that you want inside of this message, Kafka doesn't care. It's just all ones and zeros. That's, that's the way things are stored. Your serialization is going to be up to you, and that is going to be done at the producer or at the consumer level. You, have, you can have a key if you'd like, and most of the time we do have a key. So if I have, say, like a stock trade, for example, that stock trade symbol would be that key because that's how you want to define your data. I don't, you know what, I didn't see the registration over here uh, at, uh, at GIDS, uh, but uh, a lot of software conferences, what they'll do is they'll, um, they'll separate you know, by last name. So if you enter, if you enter in, you see like A through E, et cetera, uh, F through K, uh, M through P, and then P through Z. You know, if you come in and you, you know your last name, you're going to go to uh, where your, your last name is. So that's what the key is for on how to distribute this information. So Kafka producers, and this is the way it's going to look. So uh, things are sharded. 
things are distributed across multiple machines and multiple brokers. And the way this is going to look is that if you're going to be generating a message, you'll generate that message and you'll send it over to a topic, which is called logical. What? <laughs> what does logical mean here? Well, it doesn't exist in one particular place. It is partitioned out. Okay. And that's the idea here. Everything is stored with a particular offset, monotonically increasing. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, blah, 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 all the way to infinity. And so whenever we write a message, that's what will happen. And that's what you see over here. Okay? And again, immutable. Very important and append only. You can't go into one of those messages and say, oh, I want to edit that little uh, portion there. Data is temporary. So data is going to be stored within Kafka for 168 hours by default, okay, which is one week. You could change that if you want to. You could change that per topic. Uh, you could change that, I believe, per broker as well. So you have different levels on how you want to change that. And now you got to think about like why, uh, you know, what would be the amount of time that I would need for a particular financial transaction? Well, one of the things you could do for a financial transaction, process it, maybe keep it around for like two weeks or keep it around for a month or keep it around for a quarter. But then you may want to persist that a little bit longer term. And that's where you can use something like Kafka Connect to store that information into a more permanent store. And that's the idea for that. So things will get expunged, right? Uh, my zero through 200, no longer, or, or not zero, probably one. <laughs> my one through 200 uh, is gone, right? Uh, a week has passed and that's been expunged. And so that's the way that works. Uh, New York Times, the uh, a newspaper of uh, New York City, uh, they have infinity for a lot of these particular topics. And you may find that you may want infinity for some of those topics as well. So that'll be up to you. All right, things can get batched as well from the producer level. So that's just a collection of messages. Think of that like a, um, a train, for example, right? That's a high throughput thing. Whenever you uh, go to a train station, you get in a batch, that batch is called a train, <laughs> and you go to another location as one big batch. Uh, whereas uh, something that is low latency, this is getting into your car and driving to that particular destination. But you can take more people. It's better for, you know, uh, the highways for you to do that. So uh, that's what a batch is. So it increases that throughput. Again, like getting onto a bus or getting onto a train. That's what that's for. So great for sending multiple messages uh, over the wire. Okay. So um, how many of you have programmed Kafka before? Okay. In the producer, you have a producer.send. Um, and here's the thing, when you do that, it doesn't automatically send. It's not like some magic, hey, there's the message. <laughs> uh, the way that works is that things actually get prepped on what's called a buffer pool, which is like the train station, right? So the batches are the train, the buffer pool are the train station, and things get prepped there. Things hold there as well as they get sent over to that particular topic and into that particular partition. Now, this is the way that works. Murmur2 hash by and modulo by the number of partitions. So let me head on over here and uh, hopefully I don't get too loud while I'm here. Let me get my old man glasses <laughs> so that way I could see. Uh, so. Uh, the way a key works, so if you have a key to your particular message, the way this is going to work is, let's say, um, you know, someone just bought a stock at Oracle, O-R-C-L. And what you'll notice right over here is 398-062-7569 as a particular hash. I think many of you already know what a hash is, but uh, if you don't, if, if you convert a hash, the number that you get from it is going to be the same on your computer, on your computer, on your computer, on your computer, and on your computer. It's just a mathematical algorithm. And so what we'll do is we will go ahead and copy that. And I'm going to bring it over here into uh, SCOSTI. And uh, I'm going to change the number here. Let's say 25. I created a topic with 25 partitions, and um, this is ORCL, which has 
uh, gone through a murmur uh, hash algorithm. And I'm going to go ahead and do a run right now. And I see 19, which means that if I have 25 partitions in this particular topic, Oracle will always be in that particular partition. So if I need to do any kind of aggregation, if I need to do any kind of analysis that is based on that key, I know that that's always going to be uh, in that 19th partition. That's the way that works, and that's the way the sharding is going to happen. And you know that's how Kafka works uh, internally. Okay. And we know where we're going because of that particular algorithm. We know where we're headed. We are headed to you know, a particular partition that's already been pre-calculated when things get sent out, when your batches get sent out. So very much again, like university, software conferences, you have a last name, you go in, you're already sharding yourself, all right? You're like, oh, my last name is such and such, so I'm gonna go over to this particular table or this particular counter. A lot of these have been solved even you know, before computers, right? The idea of sharding and uh, sending information where they need to be. Consumers is the hard part. And one of the reasons for a consumer is, well, here's the consumer here, it is a pub sub, uh, and so what do we mean by a pub sub versus a queue? If you go to um, a grocery store and buy groceries and you're in line at the groceries, what do you get to do? Package, <laughs> package your food and you, you get to leave. That's, that's really nice. Um, but never go into a grocery pub sub. Because in a grocery pub sub, you get your groceries and you stay there forever. And only people outside of that have copies of you. But you never get to leave. Right? It's great for data, but it's not great for like grocery stores. So here, let me do this uh, slide again. So um, as a consumer, I am consuming the information from the particular partition, but those messages stay there. And that's gonna be one of the important things about that, okay? We can mark our offset and Kafka can manage the offset because I don't wanna reread that again. Uh, remember the different kinds of semantics when it comes to messaging. At least once, at most once, and exactly once, right? At least once is, hey, you're gonna get a message. You may not get it though. If zero or one is an at least once. Uh, wait, no, at least, no, I got it all wrong. At most once is that one. You'll get it or you may not get it. At least once is, hey, for every message I produce, on the other end of whatever that other end is, you may get that at least once, but don't be surprised if you get it two, three, five, 10, 100 times. Exactly once is the is a little bit of a tougher one. I'll show you, um, you know, how, how you can get close to achieving that, and hopefully I have time for that. But these offsets get marked because I don't want the uh, at least one semantics, right? I don't want to reread that information, so I wanna mark where that offset is. So when I continue afterwards, I could read from that particular spot. Then the offset will get shifted, and then I will have that new location to read from. I could read from the beginning, I could read from the end, so uh, you could programmatically change however you'd like to do things. You could also have your own storage where you can query, hey, what offset was I left at? Uh, go ahead and give me that particular offset, and I'll go ahead and read from that particular offset. So lots of different things for that. Uh, so uh, how, are things, how do things work? Well, they're distributed across multiple brokers is the way they uh, work in Kafka. So um, let's say topic A, uh, let's say, um, you know, cricket scores, right? And, uh, and plays uh, or players in cricket, um, you know, those topic would be kind of like a database name. The messages would be kind of like rows in that particular database and the partitions are how things are broken up. Remember, it's not like, you know, PostgreSQL or MySQL where you have a table and it's right there. This is gonna be distributed uh, elsewhere. So uh, I have these brokers. Brokers are server class machines is the way that's done. And so I have Kafka broker number one, Kafka broker number zero, Kafka broker number two, as many brokers as uh, you would like. And so um, that's the way things are distributed. Now, I'm gonna do this again one more time, A0, and let's say that based on that hash, right? I told you how that hash works. Say based on that hash, I want to write to A0. That means I'm gonna to write to 
Kafka broker zero is what that means, okay? And these right here are called the leaders. In Kafka, when you read or write, you read and write to the leaders. You do have followers, you do have replicas used for backup and fault tolerance, but your reads and writes go to the leaders, okay? So if I want to write to B0, I'm writing to broker number one. If I want to, one more, there we go. If I want to read or write to C0, I will go to this particular broker. And that's how we can distribute things, and that's how we can have better scaling for that. Um, but let's talk about replication. So I have a queen piece over here, and there's, a, there's the queen piece, and the queen is going to be the leader. So A0, B2, C1 are the leader. So if I want to write to B2, I'm going to write to Kafka broker uh, number zero. But the backups are going to be on other brokers. So the backup for B2, uh, there might be one on Kafka broker number one, or it could be on Kafka broker number two. Because if any one of these are going to fail, then another one can pick up leadership and you just keep on going. In fact, everything Kafka is highly obsessive about fault tolerance because that's the point. Okay, cool stuff. <laughs> All right. So PubSub comparisons, um, you know, it's a log. We're just uh, continually adding to it. Um, you could rewind it, kind of like the way Git works. Ability to be replayed, that'd be great because, hey, something bad happened uh, as I was consuming. I want to rewind back a week ago. Great, you could do that. And that's the idea for that. It is kind of like a big giant buffer, or at least that's the way I see it. Store durable in order and deterministic if a key is available, right? Uh, like I mentioned, if I have Oracle uh, trades in one, uh, in one partition, I have IBM in another, and I have uh, you know, Ford Motor Company or Target or Salesforce, right? Those are go I'm, I'm going to be very well assured because they're all uh, part of the same key. They're going to go to that same partition. So if I need to do a group buy and a sum of you know, all Salesforce's uh, stock trades, I know where to go because that's all going to be in one place. Okay, That's the way Kafka works. So I don't have to talk much about this because if you're here in the keynote, someone just talked about um, uh, just talked about the um, the RAF protocol. Uh, Zookeeper was used, uh, and I guess you could argue Zookeeper is still being used for a lot of Kafka deployments. And what that does, it holds on to a lot of the metadata that Kafka needs to use uh, in order to keep running. But that has changed uh, over to KRAFT or Craft. I don't know what the correct pronunciation is, but it's the RAF protocol that you just saw this morning, uh, but Kafka-based and message-based. So it's, it's essentially Kafka is handling its own uh, system. And so what, what usually gets stored there? Uh, the offsets, uh, the partitions, who the leaders are, uh, what replicas are in sync, ACLs, and a whole lot more. And that's the idea for that. So craft or KRAFT, Again, I'll still need to figure out how that, that is pronounced. Used to replace uh, Zookeeper for the management. Um, for deployment, you could use something called uh, combined mode. The idea for this is you have one cluster for your data, and then you have another cluster for the management quorum. So you have two different clusters for that. That's the idea of, of the way it is now. Okay, but uh, if you're doing development, if you're using a uh, Docker um, Compose, you could do something called combined mode uh, in which the same clusters are being used. Okay, there's a lot of benefit uh, uh, for that. So uh, particularly for shutdown times, and you'll notice right over here, you get uh, a lot of speed for doing that. Again, we're being obsessive here about um, you know, when something goes down, we got to keep moving, and that's why we have uh, multiple brokers and things like that. Um, if you're using cloud, a lot of this will be taken care of for you. Uh, I know uh, uh, Confluent, the backing company, has something called Confluent Cloud that would uh, take care of all that uh, for you. But if you're doing this in-house or on-prem, uh, some things to consider. Uh, you're going to have to uh, spend some money on it if you're doing it on-prem. Good hard drives, good network, 
uh, are going to be essential. Obviously storage, if you're going to be storing this a lot, you'll need some uh, good quality storage. Important one here, do not co-locate your applications due to memory page cache pollution. What, what is that? Well, here's the thing. And so one of the things that made the performance here uh, such a unique uh, benefit to Kafka is that it uses something called page cache, which is a part of your operating system memory and not a part of your JVM. It's not a part of your heap. And so whenever you write a message over to Kafka, it goes into this page cache. So that way it's quickly available. It's a you know recently written message, so that way it's available very quickly to all the consumers. Then what happens is that that inevitably gets flushed down to the hard drive um, you know, on, a, on a particular cycle, and that's what makes it available. If you cut into that, and if you host too many things on that same machine, then guess what, right? You're cutting down on that particular space that's used uh, to do so. So if you're doing this on Kubernetes, right, the thing you want to do is when you schedule these particular pods, you want to schedule this on a virtual service that is not going to be co-located and you have Kafka only on that particular system. Okay. Cloud requirements, um, again, nearly the same thing. You want good hard drive, good network, et cetera. So the guarantees here are message uh, sent by the producer to a particular topic partition will be appended in the order that they are sent. When a consumer reads it, it's going to be reading the message as they are stored on that particular partition. You'll have a replication factor. So if I create a topic with a replication factor of 10, I will tolerate nine failures uh, because I'm, once I'm down to that last one, then that's it, right? So. Uh, you have some leniency there. We have some CLI tools, so you can create topics uh, CLI level, so uh, fairly easy to do. You can list topics. You can send a message, so if you want to try things out, there's a Kafka console uh, producer, and you can receive messages as well. So this, uh, these are just like uh, utilities that you can use uh, with Kafka. <laughs> Uh, this one, if you're going to do a lot of administrative work, this is called Kafka Topics. And what this will do is it'll show the leaders, it'll show um, the in sync replicas, and everything that you need to know there. All right. Well, let's jump right in because uh, time goes by quickly. And now I'm down to 35 minutes. So let's, uh, let's jump right in. So, um, how do you program the uh, producers? Uh, Java folks, pretty good with Java. Okay. Right on. So Java is kind of like the uh, native language uh, for Kafka. Uh, but if you want to write Python or if you want to write any other languages, there's a C library called librdkafka. Uh, and you can have, you know, you can write in whatever kind of language that you want. And there are lots of different, um, how do you say drivers or plugins? I, I don't know if those are the correct terms, but um, you can have uh, different uh, libraries that would do that for you. So I'm going to focus on Java. Uh, in this particular case. All right, so here we go. So uh, establish properties, Java util properties. You set up the bootstrap server. You should have two, ignore my slide on this one, <laughs> but you should have two because what you want is if you can't communicate with one broker, you go to another. But because of the way that works, you get a uh, communication uh, going. And so again, you typically you know, put two addresses there. Key serializer, value serializer. How do you take an object like string or how do you take an object like integer and convert that into the ones and zeros so you could store that into Kafka? That's what that means. We'll create the producer object. We know, how to, we know what this means and we have the parameterized type string and integer that represents the key and that represents the value. Easy peasy. Uh, next, uh, producer record. That too is genericized. Uh, you give it the topic you give it the key, and you give it the amount. And then finally, you send a message. And remember, sending the message does not mean, woo, there it is, and it's already there in Kafka. That means it gets prepped in the buffer pool. Again, my analogy there was the train station. It gets prepped there on the train station, and then gets sent out. One of the things about that train station analogy or that buffer pool is if we have acknowledgments, I think most of you know what acknowledgments are. If I send a message and I want an acknowledgement back, I'm going to hold that in the buffer pool, 
right? Until I get that acknowledgement that I can remove it from the buffer pool. And that's the way Kafka works internally. So when I send it, uh, I will get back a metadata, which shows the partition, uh, the timestamp, um, the topic that it went to, so I can get that information. I could also use a callback, and this will be an interface with one abstract method, which means it's a lambda. <laughs> so that's the idea there, okay? Um, so in this particular example here, let me get the laser pointer here. Uh, producer record dot key and producer record dot value. One of the things that you'll notice, let me go back a couple of slides here. One of the things you'll notice here that when you review this metadata, you can have the offset, the partition, the timestamp, the topic, but nowhere on here do you have the key or value. In that particular case, this is why you want to do this. This is a closure, I don't know how to say it without making it sound like the closure programming language. It's a closure. I'll say it that way. <laughs> but it's a closed your uh, in that I am closing around the producer record and uh, getting that particular key value. And as always, uh, be a good citizen. Um, and you want to typically flush, but close will flush as well. At the end of the producer, what you want to do is you want to close things up. And why? Train station, <laughs> right? Always think about that train station. Your messages are getting prepped to get sent out, and those messages may not have been sent out yet. So if you pull the plug on the JVM, what's going to happen to those messages? See you later, right? So what you want to do is you want to be responsible in doing this and uh, close things uh, appropriately, okay? Uh, and has anyone um, heard of uh, in Java runtime.getrunTime.addShutdownHook? hook? One of the coolest things that you should know, uh, if you don't yet, this one will listen to sig term, which is what? Control C. Someone hits Control C, this gets triggered. And so that's the, probably the best place for you to do that producer uh, dot close. There is an acknowledgement that you can do as well, uh, and you would explicitly state your uh, preference for your acknowledgements. Okay? So um, there is either zero, one, or all. And you have a retries config, which is how many times do you wish to retry that? Zero, one, or all. If you want a higher guarantee, you are making a trade-off that it's going to take more time. Otherwise, there's zero. In other words, I have, I have a piece of mail that I'm going to be sending out. Do I care whether they get it or not? That's going to be zero. If I don't care, I'm just going to say zero. I don't care if you get this message. You know, if it, get, if it goes missing, who cares? But if it's important, I want to go all. And so that's part of the, the uh, trade up here. By the way, I'm getting a uh, uh, time's up here. I'm just, going to, I'm just going to keep on going. I have 30 more minutes. So I think this should be an hour. The timer, <laughs> timer's going off here. <laughs> anyway, so zero, one, or all. So zero, again, I don't care, but all I do care. Now, how does all work? All means I'm going to write to the leader, and then what's going to happen is that there's going to be a pull from the replicas, and then they're going to acknowledge to the leader, and then the leader's going to acknowledge to me. That's a lot of round-trip communication that's happening there. So when you do an all, you're paying for something. And when would you want to use an all? Uh, insurance claims, uh, stock trades, medical records, right? You want to pay for that all but you're going to get a higher latency with it. If you're reading a you know, temperature sensor and you know you're going to get a new reading in about five minutes, put it at zero, right? Who cares? Or maybe you just want the balance of this, so you would choose a one in that particular case. Remember the train station inside of that particular producer. Let's take a look at a producer and see how things work. And I'm going to get my old man glasses again where it makes my eyeballs really big. <laughs> All right, and uh, here we go. Uh, so what I have uh, over here uh, is the producer. And uh, what I have here, I'll just uh, talk about the salient parts because the thing that I want to do is I also want to cover what the consumer does as well. Uh, here are the properties. I put a lot of properties on here. Uh, I'm gonna do an ax is equal to all. I'm going to do a retry back off, and uh, I'll talk about some of these others if I do have time. If we don't, 
uh, then I hear there's a uh, excellent thing that goes on to this conference where everybody talks about things and so I could meet you out in the hallway or, or some other place and we could talk more in depth about Kafka. Um, sorry, I already made this example, but I'm using U.S. states. <laughs> uh, so I'll describe what those states are. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to randomly choose a state, and uh, I'm going to put everything into my orders, which is the topic here. The key is going to be the state, and the value is going to be the amount. Uh, let's see, on this part over here, I'm going to send the record. I am going to receive a callback. If I get metadata, that means everything was good. If I get exception, that means everything is bad. So if this is not null, then I'm going to print out uh, the exception. Otherwise, I'm just going to print out the offset, the partition, et cetera. Now, before I do, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in right over here. So it's called my dash orders. And uh, what I am going to do uh, I think I already should have uh, something running. Okay, demo gods, here we go. Hey, there we are. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on add topic right over here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my orders and here's the partitions. Boom. I'm going to do three partitions, small enough for a little demo here. And I'm going to go ahead and create, uh, create with defaults. And there it goes. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and bring up uh, a terminal here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and run that producer and fingers crossed here. And there we go. So Alaska is first. And, um, and again, these are U.S. states. And you find here partition one. So that means that Alaska is always going to be in partition one because that's the key, right? And that's what I'm uh, going to be expecting from here. Uh, here's Missouri partition one. Uh, Massachusetts partition one. Uh oh, <laughs> I'm hoping for a different partition. Uh, this is kind of hard for a small example just because I have three partitions, uh, but hopefully things will get divided enough that uh, I will see uh, different ones. If this goes wrong, then I may have added. Oh, there we go. All right, now I could breathe. <laughs> so Connecticut is now at zero. And so I should expect Connecticut uh, to be at zero. Always, right? Because that's the way uh, I made my particular key. Okay? Nice, right? Pretty easy. Let's uh, take a look uh, at some more stuff here. Uh, West Virginia is at one. And one of the things you're going to have to uh, know about is, and the hardest question in Kafka is, how many partitions do I need? What's the best number? What's the best practice for that? And the answer to that, I don't know. <laughs> That's really the answer. There are a lot of things that have to uh, be into play as to how many uh, partitions uh, you would need, uh, because that's going to affect your producers, that's going to affect your consumers, and things like that. Anyway, looks like we're rolling, so I'm going to keep this one alive and uh, have it uh, continue producing. Then I'm going to talk about the hard part, and that is consumers. So when it comes to consumers, we need groups for that because one single consumer may never, ever catch up. So this would be like me to going over to Scott and saying, Scott, grab a notebook, grab a pen, uh, you don't have to know that, <laughs> and write this down. <gasps> right? I'm, I'm like talking a lot. And Scott's like, what is, what's going on? Hold, hold, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. What was the first thing you said? Right? One consumer is not going to be able to keep up, right? Especially if you have a lot of producers. That's why you bring up a consumer group. Okay? And uh, every consumer should be on its own machine instance or pod, right? Or something that has the potential to fail. Uh, because here's the thing, if one of them fails, the others will take up. So here's the, here's the Scott in my diagram here, right? Uh, you know, this, this, uh, this poor consumer is getting inundated by what's in every particular partition. But if everything has, you know, its own job to do, then we can operate these in parallel. And that's what's called a consumer group. I also call it a team because it works together as a particular team. That's how Kafka scales. So I'm going to slow down here 
and I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but what I'm going to slow down here in uh, is that you're going to see this theme throughout this particular conference and some other talks. We do have things sharded. We do have multiple consumers. That's great. But when it comes to querying data, that may have some problems. So keep that in your mind as you go through the rest of the conference because that point will be coming up quite a bit. The thing about a consumer is, here's the thing, a producer is thread safe, so you can have multiple threads running on that one particular producer, but a consumer is not thread safe. Oh, okay, and I'll even give you warnings about that. Consumer offsets, so as I am ingesting the information, I want to mark those offsets. Kafka will do that for me under underscore underscore consumer underscore offsets. That is a topic that's automatically created. Topics that start with an underscore are called internal topics, meaning that it's not meant for public use, but it's something that uh, it will use internally to manage everything about uh, Kafka. So how do we deal with this and how do we program for this? Well, in Kafka, we have deserializer this time, right? In the producer, we had serializer, which is how do I convert an object to ones and zeros? On this side, how do I take the ones and zeros and convert that back into the object, like string and integer? But the highlight here is group. This is called a group protocol in Kafka. Your team, I'm going to run this one time, two times, three times, four times, etc. And that's, oh, I'm sorry, everyone. I didn't mean to laser you there. Um, uh, that's where that group protocol is going to be coming in. You create a consumer object, again, parameterized type by that key and value, okay? And then you process those messages. Pull is going to be the important one, consumer pull. Now, um, pull is, hey, <laughs> do you have any new records for me that I can start to read in? I have a duration of 500 milliseconds there. And so what does that mean? I'm gonna wait for 500 milliseconds. If there's some new messages, I'm gonna go ahead and bring those in. But if nothing comes in, what am I going to do? I'm gonna say, okay, we're done here. And where it says consumer records, this is a Java util iterable, meaning that I can put that into a for loop and iterate through it. Well, if I don't have any records, what's gonna happen? This for loop is just gonna go whoop right at the end there and you cycle back and life continues. And that's the way the polling works, okay? As always, be a good citizen when it comes to a consumer and close things up. Why this time? Remember, the producer.close was important because there are messages in that buffer pool that needed to get out. What's the importance here in the consumer? Well, we need those offsets committed, right? Because if I fail, right, if I read uh, offset number 27, 28, 29, and I didn't commit 29 and I fail, and you're the next consumer that is going to take over my load, where well, you're going to read those messages again. And now you're back to an at least one semantic. So careful there. Uh, consumer offset reset uh, is another configuration. Earliest or latest. Uh, I think there's also error, but usually you choose uh, earliest or latest. What does that mean? Uh, that particular one means that if I'm going to be reading from the first time, uh, the, which message in the partition am I going to read first? The latest one or the earliest one? So let's say I'm part of a consumer group called uh, GIDS 2024. It's a good name, <laughs> right? And I'm the first consumer that gets on board with GIDS 2024. I'm going to go to what's called the group coordinator, which is a selected uh, broker that is gonna manage my group. And I'm gonna say, hey, what's up? I'm part of GIDS 2024. And the, and the group coordinator is gonna say, hey, how's it going? Yeah, nice. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna give you all the partitions. Great, I'm the, you know, I'm the first one, therefore I'm the leader. But then you start to add more and more and then it gets distributed out. Okay, and that's the idea behind that. But as I'm reading this information, earliest means start from the very beginning. Latest means, let's just start reading the messages at the very end. I have about 15 minutes, so I'm gonna just jump into demo mode so that way you get it. And so that way you could go forward and Kafka everything. <laughs> All right, so this data has been uh, progressing here. And uh, what I'm going to do 
is I'm going to go to the consumer and uh, here's my consumer here. I've got a lot of settings going on. But what I'm going to do is highlight uh, the best parts here. And uh, here it is. I'm going to receive consumer records. There's that. Uh, I'm coming over here and showing you that this is all part of a particular group ID. And here's the group ID. It'll just be called my group. And there it is. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and run this once, twice, three times, maybe four times. The thing I want you to remember if, uh, if you saw that earlier is that when I created this particular topic, I created it with three partitions. Keep that in mind. And remember, these orders are going into each of those partitions. So, sorry, freaking out for a bit. Okay, now I remember. <laughs> okay, so what I'm going to do, this is rolling, this is the producer. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in over here and I'm going to run my consumer and we will see what happens here. And there we go. It just ingested everything from partition one. Uh, looks like there's a lot of partition ones. That was kind of accidental, but there's partition zero, et cetera, et cetera. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to run it again two different ones. Now, remember, a consumer is likely going to be running um, in different nodes, let's say on Kubernetes or different locations. So if, you know, something fails on one, then we're going to be okay. But what I'm going to do here is I'm going to roll it again. Again, I have one consumer that's already rolling. I'm going to go ahead and do that again. And these are all part of the same group. And we see over here, partitions assigned to. Here's this one right over here. Oh, and what we should see here is the following. Partitions assigned 0 and 1. Remember, I had three partitions on here. And look what happened before. The first consumer that got on board had 0, 1, and 2. But a new one got on board, and so there was a, uh, a redistribution or a rebalance as to what's happening there. That's a good thing. So it got revoked, and we see that right over here. And so what we'll see then is this, okay? We've got new partitions on here, so this is listening to zero and one. All right, well, here, let's come in over here and do it again. All right, so now I have three consumers out of three partitions. Obviously, what's gonna happen, right? Perfect one-to-one -one correlation between the partitions and the consumers, right? And that's why we have that distribution, so that way we could process in a timely fashion, and here's what we see over here. This one got number one, and uh, let's take a look at some of the others here. This one has number one, uh, this one is reading number two, and then this one here is reading number zero. Beautiful. What do you want me to do next? I, I can feel, I can feel what your next uh, question is. What happens if you do a fourth one? Oh, right? I have three partitions, what happens if I do a four? Well. Here we go. Uh, so running the consumer again, and away we go. Who won? Uh, so this one now is running zero. Uh, this one is running two. This one is uh, nothing. Oh my goodness. This one particular consumer is not doing any work whatsoever. I just happen to program it as a standby. So if one of these fails, then now this one is going to be able to take over, okay? And that's the way the consumers uh, work, right? Pretty cool, right? So um, here, let me just uh, control C one of these others. Now let's do this one here. See, it's busy and I'm gonna be like, you know, control C and uh, that should close things up. And uh, when I take a look at this one over here, I'm just gonna hang out a, well, maybe it did get two already. Which one was the unemployed one? Uh, I guess it happened already. There's zero, there's one, and then there's two. Wow, it acted a lot faster than I thought it would. Usually I have to wait a while, and usually there is a pause when a rebalance happens. So if a consumer goes down, the others are going to take up uh, where they left off. Okay, pretty cool. All right, and that's the way, yeah, that's the way a consumer works. Very happy about that. All right, I could also do manual commits. Oh, and before I do, do uh, manual commits, I'm gonna go over to the web 
And if you want to show others and spread the word on this, uh, and let's go ahead and do this one. Software mill. So what you're going to do is software mill, Kafka visualization. There it is. And uh, it's a pretty cool thing. Take a look at this. So if you go to this website and share with others, and again, software mill, if you're doing notes, uh, software mill, Kafka visualization. Um, and uh, here's the way it looks. So uh, what you see here is a visualization of everything that I just described. Producer is going to produce, uh, has a key, has a value associated with it. The, it writes to the leader. And if I hover over this, maybe, <laughs> there it is. Uh, the uh, one that is opaque is the leader partition. That means that's where things are going to get written to. Uh, the more translucent one is going to be the follower. So as you see here, 16 just uh, got written and 16 is also backed up right over here. And right over here, I see the consumers. One of the things that I could do since there are two partitions here, uh, maybe what I could do is add a consumer and you could just visualize uh, everything that happened. So another great way that you could take a look at that. And you could also shut down a broker. Uh-oh, broker just went down. And so the leadership changes over to the other broker. Okay, nice. So some other items. Okay, I have about 10 minutes left. Um, Commits are, are automatic uh, from the consumer side. It's actually every five seconds. So your brains are, I know are working right now is like, is that safe or not? In other words, the offsets are going to be sent over to Kafka. Let's say I process again, 27, 28, 29. I'm going to submit offset 29. Oh, I'm gonna actually submit 30. It's always the next one. I'm gonna submit 30 as the next one that I am going to read. That takes place automatically every five seconds plus. It's actually when you call poll on the consumer that that happens. But if you wanna take over, you could do enable auto commit config, set that to false. Now the committing of offsets is now up to you and when you want to do that, okay? You could do a synchronous commit or you could do an asynchronous commit. So here are the two different ones here. Let me go back to that other one. I think it went too fast there. So what you'll do is you go to the properties and you'll set enable auto commit to false. Ooh. Then you have a synchronous commit. What is, a, what is a synchronous? It will block. What is block? When a thread goes like this and then it does, right? And it's not moving there, right? That's a block, okay? So how do you do that? You'll do consumer commit sync. In other words, you're committing those offsets but blocking the thread, and when you're done, then you will continue. Asynchronous would be, I want to commit those particular offsets asynchronously, and so that just means jump onto another thread and commit your uh, offsets there. It is a lambda, so you'll determine if that was successful or not and decide what you want to do with it. This is where things get hard because what happens if it was unsuccessful, that's gonna be up to you. And you could use both. And uh, so in an example here, you could use commit sync at the very end, like when you're about to shut out the, you know, shut down the JVM, you wanna make sure that that blocks. Again, blocking isn't necessarily a bad thing. You just strategically decide where you want to apply that. And then the commit async you could do inside of the while loop. There are lots of different strategies for that. Uh, I already showed you a consumer uh, rebalance um, but what's happening behind the scenes is that there are heartbeats that are being sent from the consumer saying, I'm still alive, I'm still alive, I'm still alive. There's another one where you have to call poll very frequently to say, I'm still doing work, I'm still doing work, I'm still doing work. And you could change those settings in case any one of those consumers goes down, then it will deem, hey, this consumer is no longer uh, working. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, this particular consumer is officially down. I'm going to hand the work over to some of the others. You could also leave the group as well. So you could tell that group coordinator, I'm done. I'm out of here. I quit this job. <laughs> and uh, a rebalance will occur. And you just saw what a rebalance will do. Again, uh, any one of the consumers will fail. And then, you know, we just keep moving. And that's the idea for everything uh, Kafka.
And one of the things I, I showed with the code, but maybe too quick, but here's a slide for that. Uh, there is something called a consumer rebalanced listener. So you can um, take a look and see what's been assigned to you and what's been uh, revoked, okay? So I showed you the consumers. I showed you the visualization. Um, again, great way to discuss what Kafka does and visualizations are absolutely great. Retention, you could change. Uh, I had mentioned this before, but 168 hours is the default, after which time uh, any messages that are older than that will get expunged. And that's why you want to use a Kafka Connect if you want to keep that information for a lot longer. Okay? You could change this per broker, or you could have this per topic. Now, last one here is compaction. And the idea for compaction is this. Some of the topics are table in structure. Some of the topics are stream in structure. And this is going to be the important part. And so this means, what does a table mean? If I have an employee topic, I may want to keep that around for a long time, for one. But I also want to index things like a table. So let's say that you, know, you went into a company and you just saved them a billion dollars, right? And I have one employee record with your name, your, your last name, your address, and your salary. But something's changed, right? You saved the company a billion dollars. So we're going to give you a raise. Congratulations. Big, huge raise uh, for saving the company a lot of money. So what am I going to do? Well, I could treat a topic like a database. <gasps> what? <laughs> I thought you said it was a pub sub. What's going on? You could treat it like a database, and we often do. This is going to be a part of streaming. I have another talk on streaming uh, a little bit later. But the idea for a table, it's still a topic, but we either perceive a topic like a table or we perceive it like a stream. And that's going to be the important part for a lot of this. So employee record again. Someone saved the company a billion dollars. They get a raise. That new document overrides the old one. And I don't, if I don't care about the old one, you know, that's, that's a thing that we often do because I want to treat that topic like a table. I want to treat that topic like a database. And we have something called compaction. And compaction means delete all the old records with the same key. So if you take a look at this particular image over here, I have gold key and I have a red key. Okay? Just representing the key. Keep the latest one, so five and three. Because with that new employee record, I don't care, if I don't care about the past, I want that expunged, right? Because I want to treat that like a table. And that'll be coming up quite a bit. And then after a while, you get more keys and more keys and more keys onto this. And then when you go through that compaction, it just does this, right? And it keeps doing that uh, because you're just retaining all that new information. Um, I have some more information here, but I think I'm uh, getting close to it. There's things called ISRs, which are uh, replicas that are in sync. Uh, the notion of this, and I, I told you what replicas are, they are the backups, but they need to be in sync within the last 10 seconds or so. If it isn't, then they are not going to be candidates for any kind of leadership. And that's the way Kafka works internally. So as an example over here, Remember, all reads and writes go to the leader. So I'd be writing to this particular partition in this particular broker. If this fails, if the leader fails, the ISR needs to be kept up to date within that 10 seconds. If it isn't, it's not a candidate for leadership. So if that goes down, new leader would be the one that is kept up to date. All right? So again, remember this image. It's a big thing in our modern uh, world in our modern enterprises right now. Kafka is the you know, central place where the data goes. Uh, to keep it, we usually use connect to store things into a database. Pinot has come out ahead to aggregate the information that is not only in Kafka, but also in databases and also in your Spark. Your microservices communicate with Kafka as multi-tenant. And the streams will take the information from your topic do something with it, and post it into another topic. That's that real-time management that we are talking about. Okay? Groovy. And that was our agenda. Hope you got a lot out of it. And enjoy the rest of the conference, and thank you. <laughs>